Hey, this is Dan, just dropping you a quick line before you start this episode to let you know a couple of things. What you're about to listen to is one of the classic best of episodes of Assorted Goods in its older format. And by older format, I mean the sandbox and completely disorganized style that Assorted Goods was for its first few years of existence. Now, since then, the feed has been cleaned up, and there's 12 of these classic episodes. And you should know, if you're a new listener, that these episodes are not really what the show is now. But they're still good, and they're still worth listening to. But just be warned that if you're looking to get into Assorted Goods as it is now, that you probably want to go to the latest episode in your feed. Start listening from there. Throughout the episode, you might hear certain things get mentioned, like the website or the social media. Now, those have changed. So don't go chasing those websites or links after the episode. Go to these ones instead. The website has now disinformed.ca, CA for, you know, Canadians like me. And that's where you can find all the assorted good stuff that is mentioned in these episodes. You can find the source lists and additional information. They have all moved to there. In terms of emailing, you can email me now with the new email, dan at disinformed.ca. And if you want to follow on social media, Twitter and Instagram, the new handles are at Disinformed Dan. And hey, look, all three of those are kind of similar with each other, creating some sort of uh, continuity. People tell me that's important. But anyways, whether you're a new listener or a returning listener, I hope you enjoy this classic episode of Assorted Goods. And then I hope you subscribe to the show and come along for the ride with the new episodes as well. And as always, thank you for listening and enjoy. Let me put you in someone's shoes for a moment. You're an 18-year-old nobody, living in the beautiful province of British Columbia, Canada. A competitive kid, determined, hardworking, hates losing. A talented athlete, so you take up multiple sports. Perfect way for a competitive kid to find a challenge. But a lingering pain in your knee gets worse and worse. And before long, your whole life that bright future ahead of you has shrunk down to a single battle. Hey folks, I'm Dan from over at the Assorted Goods Podcast, and I'm tagging in for this episode for Jay to tell a story from the Great White North. A story of a Canadian nobody. Probably our country's greatest nobody. This is a tale that maybe doesn't fit the typical mold of this show. It's not a spur-of-the-moment act of heroism. And this episode is also going to be a little bit longer. Well, I guess I got carried away when I was asked to put together an episode. This story, though, isn't about someone unknown. It's a classic tale of triumph and tragedy. And our nobody today didn't just get a moment of fame. Their moment lasted months, and their legacy now spans the globe. Nevertheless, it's a story that's always worth telling, because every hero was once a nobody, and in history, there's nobody quite like Terry Fox. Our nobody this episode was born on July 28, 1958, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, the second of four children born to Betty and Raleigh Fox. The family moved west from Manitoba to British Columbia after getting sick of the freezing winters in Winnipeg, an understandable reason if you've ever experienced winter there. The family would settle in Port Coquitlam, B.C., where Terry Fox would become highly active in sports, playing baseball, soccer, rugby, and running cross-country. But the sport he loved to play was basketball, and although he was undersized for the game, he worked tirelessly not only to make his high school basketball team, but also to become a starting player. Terry would graduate from high school with distinction, a co-winner of the Athlete of the Year Award at Port Coquitlam High School. Fox was apparently unsure about continuing his education, until he was convinced by his mother to attend Simon Fraser University, where he would enroll in the kinesiology program. 
Fox's athletic tenacity and drive would lead him to make the Simon Fraser basketball team, beating out more talented players through his extensive work ethic. The story is the same with Terry for his whole life. Driven. Focused. Unrelentingly determined. All qualities that make a nobody prime for something greater. Shortly after he began at Simon Fraser University, though, in November 1976, Fox was on the road heading back home when he was in a minor car accident. Now, Terry emerged from the accident relatively unscathed, except for a pain in his right knee. That pain would flare up again in the coming months, and Terry, unwilling to miss out on the basketball season, chose to leave it until the season was over. But in March of 1977, the pain in his knee reached an unbearable point, and his father would take him to the emergency room. And that's where everything would change for Terry Fox. He was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, a type of bone cancer, and would have to have his right leg amputated above the knee. The day, the day after I went into the hospital, I, I learned that I had a malignant tumor, and that three days later my leg was going to have to be amputated. It was a real shock at first, but uh, um, I took it right from the start as a challenge. I never, I never got depressed or upset about it, and uh, I fought it right, right from the start. So, it was, actually, I had a, a lot of help from friends and relatives, so I never, never really got down at all. Imagine that. 18 years old, a fantastic competitor and athlete, losing a leg. It's a cruel twist of fate. And fateful is exactly what this moment would turn out to be. The night before his surgery, one of Terry's high school coaches brought him a magazine article that talked about a man named Dick Tron, who had run the New York City Marathon with a prosthetic leg. And that story would stick with Terry. Now, you'd think, and maybe for many it would be the case, but being an athletic kid who loses a leg at 18 might sap anyone's spirit. But as you heard in that clip there, not Terry Fox. Just three weeks after the amputation, he was walking with an artificial leg, and not long after, he was playing golf with his dad, impressing his doctors with his progress, and more than that, with his positive attitude towards making the best of the situation. Not long after all that, and while Fox was still undergoing chemotherapy, another Canadian hero, a man named Rick Hansen, who had suffered a spinal cord injury and was confined to a wheelchair himself, approached Terry Fox. Hansen, by the way, would end up being a multiple-time Paralympic athlete who won six medals, by the way. But in 1977, he invited Terry Fox to join the wheelchair basketball team that Hansen was a part of, and Fox would do just that. And over the next three years, Terry Fox would help that team win three national championships, and in 1980 would be named an all-star. But the time he spent in treatment, receiving chemotherapy for 16 months, left a mark on Terry Fox that he couldn't ignore. While he was in treatment, he witnessed other patients, some the same age as him and some even younger, struggle and pass away from their illness. Once again, that drive and determination kicked in, and Terry decided that he had to do something greater. In late 1979, he formulated his plan of running a marathon. But not just any marathon, though. Fox planned to run across Canada, from coast to coast, in an effort to raise funds for cancer research. Along with his friend Doug Allward, the person who he had shared the Athlete of the Year award with in high school, Fox started making plans, training, and seeking support for his journey. I really, I really didn't know what cancer was all about until I had it, eh? right. And then I went through a year and a half of chemotherapy treatments where I lost my hair temporarily. It came back in curly, and I, went, I was very sick and unhealthy. And I met... Well, comparatively to other people, cancer patients, I was very healthy and uh, it had a real impact on me on living with people who were, who were dying and, and very sick and unhealthy. And, and this is a very a big motivational reason for running for me. And I, I feel by, by running, I can, I can really set an example, example for these people. Now, at first, his family was hesitant. They were worried about his health, of course, and this upset Terry, who said he assumed that he would have their full support, but families worry, and that's understandable. And Fox would say that running on his prosthetic leg was tough and painful. He would enter a marathon for practice, finishing last, but moving the crowd and fellow runners to tears watching him complete the marathon regardless. He started with the goal of a million dollars, 
Terry Fox contacted the Canadian Cancer Society requesting support for his effort in a letter where he wrote, quote, Somewhere the hurting must stop. Fox would continue to try to find support from various organizations as well, who would cover small pieces of the journey. For example, the Ford Motor Company donated the van that would accompany him along the way, Imperial Oil would cover the cost of the fuel, and Adidas gave him running shoes. In April 1980, Fox and Allward would leave British Columbia and fly to St. John's, Newfoundland, where, on April 12, 1980, his marathon of hope would begin. It started by dipping his prosthetic leg in the Atlantic Ocean, and then Terry Fox would average 26 miles a day as he made his way through the Atlantic provinces, into Quebec, and then Ontario. Through terrible weather, snow, rain, blistering heat. Strangely enough, although the story of Terry Fox's marathon lives on now, it was hardly noticed at first. He got some attention in Newfoundland, but local and national media had left his story as little more than an afterthought in the early days. The Canadian Cancer Society, who Fox had appealed to for support, didn't quite support him that well at first either. Branches of the CCS in the eastern provinces, where Terry was running early on, had not notified the locales where Fox would be running. In some cases, his marathon was cheered on and supported, and in other small towns along the way, nobody had any clue what was going on. Cars passing by sometimes honked in support. Other times, honked to try to drive this limping runner off the road. Running on his prosthetic leg was tough and painful, as I said. Fox told the story once that it hurt for about the first 20 minutes before he said he would cross a pain threshold, and then after that, was fine to continue on. By the 6th of May, he had run through Newfoundland. From the 7th to the 24th, he made his way through Nova Scotia. Prince Edward Island was a short one, completed in just three days, from the 24th to the 27th. New Brunswick took him until June 10th, at which point he was out of the Atlantic provinces and into Quebec. Again, Fox was running on one leg through all kinds of weather, every day, with varying levels of support and love depending on where he was, as well as physical pain both from his prosthetic leg, but also the blisters and broken toenails he'd get on the other foot, dehydration from running a marathon all day. I mean, let all that sink in. On one leg, running a marathon a day. Sheesh, I mean... I can barely make it to the end of the block and back sometimes. There was also the frustration of not feeling like anyone had even noticed his journey. Fox and his friend Dog Allward, who was there supporting them, apparently also got into fights with each other and wouldn't talk for periods of time, Fox feeling that Allward hadn't been doing enough to help the marathon get noticed. And this is the part of Terry Fox's story that made me go, oh, you know? Growing up here in Canada, it's always a streamlined version, like it always is with stories like this, you know? It's more the myth than the reality. Because in reality, Canada hardly noticed his marathon of hope. Support and fundraising was weak for a long time. But, nevertheless, Terry Fox continued and pushed forward. The $1 million goal Fox had ended up evolving in his mind when he received a $10,000 donation from a small town of 10,000 people. Fox then believed he could raise a dollar for every Canadian, 24 million people at the time. But the frustration of the lack of media coverage and widespread support continued when Terry Fox finally arrived in Ottawa, Canada's capital, and met the Prime Minister of the country on July 4, 1980. In Terry Fox's journal, he described his disappointment, stating that Prime Minister Trudeau, the first Prime Minister Trudeau, that is, but apparently the PM had little knowledge of what Fox was actually doing. According to Terry Fox, the Prime Minister didn't even know he was running for cancer research. But Terry's frustration would soon be alleviated a little bit. Support had grown when he entered the province of Ontario, along with meeting the Prime Minister, and since he had continued to push through his cross-country marathon for what had been almost three months at this point, the story had started to really gain traction. Fox's tenacity and drive had made his marathon of hope really an unavoidable story. He arrived in Toronto, my home city, on July 11, 1980. He gave a speech, as he often did along his journey, and that day in Toronto alone, Fox raised $100,000. After that, it was a constant national story, and Fox reached celebrity status. It helped, according to the research I did on this story at least, 
that Fox was a charismatic, good-looking, charming young man and gave off a humble persona that Canadians could easily get behind. And at this point, the tables actually kind of turned. Now being unnoticed wasn't the issue for Terry. It became getting noticed too much, with people constantly running up to him during his runs, so much so that he felt they had become distractions. So the Canadian Cancer Society, who had begun to really organize and support the marathon, set up scheduled points for Terry to talk and mingle with the locals. On one such stop, Fox actually took a little time off, something he did only a few times over the course of his journey, to spend time with a 10-year-old boy, Greg Scott. I'm crying now because I, there's somebody here right now who is going through the same thing that I went through. The exact same thing, and he's only 10 years old. And I... I had the most inspirational uh, day of my life today. And so Terry gave himself an afternoon off from the Marathon of Hope to swim with Greg. It was just the fourth day off in 137 days on the road. 137 days on the road, running a marathon a day, and then taking a day off to spend time with a boy who not only had cancer, but had also lost his leg to the disease like Terry. And this is what he was running for, for kids like Greg. And here's the thing, and yet another piece of the story that gets kind of lost in the history, covered by the myth, really. As Terry Fox's celebrity status grew, so did the inevitable reality of being in the public eye. Some news outlets ran stories focusing on Terry personally, stating that Fox had a fiery temper and had little regard for his own health, criticizing a man who was clearly willing to sacrifice everything for a great cause. Maybe this is a great example of that reality, that nobody can ever truly be a flawless hero. Even someone like Terry Fox got slammed by certain members of the press, which, as some records show, led to a strained relationship between Fox and the media. In one instance, a reporter published an article stating that Fox had not, in fact, ran through Quebec, but had actually been driven. That article ended up being retracted pretty quickly. And that's another crazy piece to this story. For so much of his marathon of hope, Terry Fox was frustrated that so little attention was being given to him, a man on one leg running the length of a country to raise money for charity. And then, at a blink, he was a celebrity, and with it came all the agitations of fame. But again, as always, Terry kept running, and running, and made his way upwards through northern Ontario. There was... Another undeniable reality, though. Running a marathon a day for a cancer patient has to take a toll on the body. His doctors were concerned, not just for the immediate moment, but for what the marathon might do to Terry's body long term. But what have we learned so far in this story? Well, nothing was going to stop Terry Fox when he set his sight on this goal. He had been running this marathon for months on end, and he had endured physical pain that most of us could never even remotely stand. And yet, he kept running. But through the month of August, Fox began to feel exhausted before he even began his daily runs. As he made his way through the beautiful scenery of northern Ontario, and as he closed in on the town of Thunder Bay on September 1st, 1980, Terry Fox began to experience extreme chest pain and a coughing fit. With crowds cheering him on to continue and not give up, Terry had to be taken to the hospital. The following day, Fox made an appearance to make an announcement about his marathon. And I had noticed a little bit of hardness in breathing, and at the end, near the end of the day, at 18 miles, um, I was coughing and choking and had pain in my neck and my chest. And I did three more miles, and I, had to, I decided I had to go see the doctor. And it was discovered then that uh, I had primary, originally I had primary cancer in my knee three and a half years ago. And uh, that the cancer had spread. And now I've got cancer in my lungs. And uh, we got to go home and, tr and try and do some more treatment. But... Uh, All I can say is, uh, if there's any way I can get out there again and finish it, I will. Terry and his family returned to British Columbia to receive treatment for what was now lung cancer, another cruel twist of fate. 
His journey ended after 143 days, totaling 5,373 kilometers. That's 3,339 miles for you Americans. And in the end, he raised $1.7 million, surpassing his original goal. A week later, the CTV television network held a fundraiser in support of Fox and Cancer Research, who, by this point, was a long way from being our nobody. That telethon raised over $10 million for cancer research. And in the following months, Terry got the recognition that he wholeheartedly deserved, granted the Order of Canada, one of our nation's highest honors, as well as the Order of the Dogwood, the province of British Columbia's highest honor. Fox was also awarded the Lou Marsh Award, Canada's Athlete of the Year Award, and the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame commissioned a permanent exhibit of Terry's journey. And in April of 1981, Seven months after the Marathon of Hope had come to an end, fundraising surpassed $24 million, a dollar for every Canadian. Fox's ultimate goal had been reached. When Fox found out he had cancer again, he told his father, quote, It happens all the time, to other people. I'm not special. He added, I could have sat on my rear end. I could have forgotten what I'd seen in the hospital. But I didn't. Good evening. Terry Fox died this morning in a British Columbia hospital, one month before his 23rd birthday. His family was with him. Hospital officials broke the news at daybreak. Sheldon Turcott was there. It was shortly after dawn at the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster when the news of Terry's death was announced by the Deputy Director of Nursing, who had known Terry as a patient for more than four years and who had remained in the hospital for the past week without going home. Terry has completed the last kilometer of his marathon. A short while ago, at approximately 25 to 5 BC time, he died. He died surrounded by love. After battling for months, Terry Fox passed away at the age of 22. He would be buried in Port Coquitlam, BC, and on his grave are the words he wrote to the Canadian Cancer Society when he appealed to them for support before his marathon. Somewhere, the hurting must stop. Terry lived a life full of determination and a relentless drive to take on and conquer all challenges. He ran over 5,000 kilometers on one leg, stepping up in his moment to make his life mean so much more than just the unfair battle he was given. He started out a nobody, he died a national hero and an inspiration to millions across the globe. The Marathon of Hope lasted 143 days, but 40 years later, Terry Fox's impact lives on. He changed the way disabled people were viewed and how they were able to view themselves and see what they could accomplish. And in 1981, after Terry's death, the Terry Fox Run was created a now annual event that millions of people in Canada and across the globe take part in to continue to raise funds for cancer research. Growing up, I participated in multiple Terry Fox runs, like so many Canadians do. And to this day, fundraisers in Terry Fox's name have raised over $750 million. And in this decade, that number should surpass the billion-dollar mark. Unbelievable and far and beyond the original goals that Terry set out. I'd hope that he'd be proud of the mark he left. Also, survival rates for osteosarcoma, the cancer Terry originally had in his knee, are now up to about 70 to 80 percent, a vast improvement from 40 years ago. So, perhaps, part of Terry Fox's dream actually has come true, at least so far. The amazing thing about the stories told on this show is that they're typically quick, people, you know, who stepped up in a moment and then seemingly were forgotten by the world just as quick. Nobodies who became heroes, and then the world watches them fade back to normal life. Like I said at the start, Terry Fox's moment wasn't quick. It lasted months. It was filled with struggle, hardship, pain, the kind of circumstances that would leave just about any one of us nobodies defeated. Terry Fox, as it turned out, was far from a nobody. He was the best of everybody. And maybe his story is the reminder we all need right now. 
that if a kid from Winnipeg can overcome the impossible to change the world, then, well, what's our excuse? I want to thank you for listening to this episode of An Absolute Nobody. Thank you to Jay for giving me the chance to stop in and tell this tale of a Canadian hero. Thanks for hanging in for this longer show, and if you're interested, I hope you'll stop by and listen to the Assorted Goods podcast, where each episode I dive into a collection of topics, big or small, past or present, and try to learn a little more about them. You can find Assorted Goods wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoy An Absolute Nobody, and, well... Assorted Goods too, I guess. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review these great shows. And you can follow An Absolute Nobody, as well as Assorted Goods, on social media as well. Thanks again for listening. Take care, folks. <laughs>